Let's pray. We'll turn our attention uh, to our text this morning. Father, we are grateful um, that uh, you gather us as, as your people from um, a, a, a global people, a historic people, um, but united um, in faith in Christ, washed in the blood of Christ, and empowered by the Spirit of Christ uh, as your people. Um, and Lord, we pray for um, um, your, your insight, um, your wisdom, as we consider what you have to say to us today in your word. In the name of Jesus, our King, amen. All right, our text today, continuing in our series, United in Christ from Ephesians, uh, is Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, we'll read verses 1 to 13. If you are looking at one of the few Bibles, that's on page 568. You can see the text um, on, uh, on the screen as well. Uh, so, so please uh, invite you to follow along as I read. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to, life for, to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places." This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So let's ask a question of very long standing. What constitutes a good life. What constitutes a good life? If we had been living in the time of the Apostle Paul, living in, in the, the world of Hellenistic culture that, that pervaded the Mediterranean region where he lived, we would have known that, that for centuries the, the great thinkers of Greek culture had pondered this question. In our time, philosophy is a very technical discipline. Um, and, um, and in, is even intimidating to other academics. I think they call a doctorate degree doctor of philosophy just to help everybody kind of get over their fear of philosophy uh, in, in that direction. But in the ancient world, even though you know, people were thinking deep thoughts that, that would rival those of, of modern philosophers, there was a very specific aim, which was to discover what is a good life to try to, to determine that so that that could be, that could be lived out. Uh, you know, even in our own time uh, at Harvard University, which is only slightly less prestigious than the University of Illinois, Harvard University a couple of years ago appointed Arthur Brooks essentially as a professor of happiness uh, who, was, who was there to, to study what it is that, that that makes for a life that is happy and productive and that can be called good. And I've got to admit, I'm kind of an Arthur Brooks fan. When I see an Arthur Brooks article, I drop everything and read it, and I feel happy just, just for a moment uh, at, at the very least. Um, well, you know, we think about what is a good life, and then we kind of realize a lot of people are trying to define that for us, and not just Aristotle or Arthur Brooks. But um, family may be defining that for us and maybe creating some expectations that are perhaps sometimes burdensome. Or maybe it's a peer group 
maybe it's our professional setting or our academic setting that's setting expectations for us. Maybe it's just society at large. Maybe it's, it's Instagram or, or TikTok that is telling us, you know, this is, this is what you ought to be. And we recognize, oh, you know, this, this business of a good life is, is troublesome, is bothersome. Sometimes it's burdensome. Sometimes it, it even feels oppressive. As much as I'd like to have a good life, trying to attain what some define as a good life seems unobtainable, and my perceived failure to do that is something that weighs on me. Well, I want us to, to think now about how that would fit into the life of people who were reading this letter. Imagine yourself one of these early Christians, part of really the first generation of, of the Christian faith. This is, is something new. It is something unprecedented. It cuts across the grain of, of every aspect of your experience prior to, to coming into this. You have received this message as a reader of this letter through this mysterious man named Paul. He's Jewish, and some of you early Christian believers share that heritage with them, but others are outside it, and you've always seen that group as other and, and different from you. You've been invited into faith in the God of of Israel, but through a means and a path which even the people of Israel had not fully understood or anticipated. As Paul says in this text, it was a mystery. Now you're a part of that. And that's led to all kinds of, honestly, trouble in your life. You're now having difficulty with your peer group, with your professional life with your family. It's reflected in the New Testament as we read about Paul in Ephesus and, and the silversmiths are all upset because the idol business is declining because of Christian influence and, and they end up, you know, sparking a, uh, an economic riot uh, in, in response to this. And now, years after that, you have word in your place that the hero of your faith, the one through whom you've heard this good news that you now believe in, He's, he's a Roman prisoner, and he's on trial for his life. Generally speaking, this is the kind of thing you leave out of your resume. But how do you process that as someone who's come to faith through his mi ministry? Is he just another of the many people who pass through a place with an appealing message, uh, who are operating... Uh, in, in what they're doing out of, out of greed or in exploitation? Is this all a lie that you have believed in? Or maybe has the God that Paul believed in abandoned him, as he might also abandon you? These are the kinds of questions that this situation would raise. Paul's gospel offered to Christians, and they believed that it was offering them the answer to what is a good life. Their mentor now is awaiting trial for his life. What in the world does all of that mean? Well, I want to suggest today that as we think about the way that Paul is processing this reality, it's going to help us come to grips with the core Christian answer to the question, what constitutes a good life? And to do that, we're going to draw a contrast between what the text is implying about other ways of viewing this and then what Paul is actually saying a good life consists of. Now, I had a kind of an ambition for this message. I remembered vaguely something from uh, Men in Black, which I think of as a current movie. <laughs> and, you know, something about what was what was it, old and broke versus the new hotness or something like that. Some of you more into the stuff will, uh, will maybe remember that line. And unfortunately, I did have a, a realization that is not a current movie. So I thought, I'm, I'm going to crowdsource this, okay? Um, and so I asked on social media, somebody help me know what's the current language for old and bad versus new and good. And I was gonna, I was gonna drop that in. This was an interesting experiment. I got a lot of advice 
a lot. I learned a lot of things that I'm now trying to forget. Okay? And I, I wanted to have just one phrase, but I'm, I, couldn't, I couldn't decide. I couldn't even really make sense of anything. So I'm just going to drop the whole thesaurus into this message, okay? All right, so it's not going to be on the screen. You don't have to take notes. There'll be no quiz. But here we go. But let's talk about what it is to evaluate a life united to the world. And to make clear, this is, this is the old and broke, or to make it more current, this is cringe, basic, dog water, mid, git, chuggy, sus, sketch, whack, ratchet. Okay? Okay. You can correct me after the service. Okay? All right. By the way, this is, it's, you know, it's prom season now, and I'm, I'm remembering why I didn't go to prom back in the day. <laughs> just, I just can't manage it. I just can't do it. Okay. All right. So what is, how does the, how does the world the thing that as Christians we have abandoned, left, our, left behind, how does it evaluate a good life? Well, for the world, a good life is tribal. A good life is tribal. Paul's world was intensely tribal. Um, ethnic identity played a very important role in, in the, the ancient world. Now, in Paul's world, you know, there was a kind of a pervasive culture over everything. It was the pervasive culture of Hellenism, Greek culture. Rather the way that even globally Western culture has, has done, you know, has had an impact in, in all aspects of, of, of life around the world. You know, in, in such mundane things as calendars, for example. You know, there are different calendars in operation in different parts of the world, but everybody kind of from doing business, they, they use that, that Western calendar as an example. But in a, in a world where there is a pervasive culture like that, um, you know, we gain identity and power and a home by belonging to a group. And that group identity was very important in Paul's world, very important. So being a loyal member of your group, very important. You know, let's, let's think about this. What made early adolescence or is making er early adolescence so difficult? Or what makes that first year of university so, so difficult? Well, there are lots of things, but one of them is just trying to belong, trying to be a part of the tribe. And for those of us who've passed through those experiences, if we asked, is it getting any easier, we'd say, no, that's just kind of normal. That's just kind of normal, wondering if we fit in. For the, the world, a good life is tribal. For the, good, the world, a good life is powerful. This almost goes without saying. I mean, who doesn't want power? One of the reasons that as a family we had to give up playing games like Risk and Monopoly. Yeah, okay, you know where I'm going with this. We had to just stop as a family playing games where you won by annihilating other members of the family because it just too much appealed to that need for power, okay? Um, there, I'll just say the, the phrase, Kale, she feels beat up on, um, gained a kind of a, um, a, a currency in our family because of the last game of risk we ever played, I think, okay? We all want power, don't we? Um, it is better to be a master than a servant. It is better to be wealthy than to be poor. It is better to give orders than receive them. It is better to be faculty than student. It is better to be pastor than member. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, this is confession. Okay. It is, for, in Paul's situation, it is better to take prisoner than to be prisoner. These, these, are, these are the things that we, le le we, we live with every day. And for the ancients, there's a particular way of ordering and understanding the world. When Paul, in this text, talks, uses words like principalities and powers, he's referring to the understanding that in the unseen world of the spirit, there are powerful unseen beings who in turn impart power to those who are powerful in the world, to people like the emperor and those who, who work under him. And so there's a kind of a, a, a union between the powers of the spirit world and the political, social, economic powers of the world. And for the world, 
Well, it's a good thing to have that. Why did the pagans worship their gods? Not because they loved them, but that they hoped that they would at least leave them alone and maybe do them some good, grant them some power, give them some of that, that unction that they needed to exist in the world. For the world, a good life also seeks to gain knowledge. Seeks to gain knowledge. Now, okay, um, I learned long ago that knowledge is power. Uh, I, it really warms my heart to know that Schoolhouse Rock is back on Disney+. Plus. Okay, just, just so, so much. And, of course, you know, Schoolhouse Rocky taught us that knowledge is power, but so did some other people, Francis Bacon, Kofi Annan, and Mary J. Blige. Um, all of these folk have told us that knowledge is power. Um, you know, I mentioned Aristotle earlier. Um, he looms large in Paul's world, even as he does in ours. How, how many of, of our students in classes have heard that ancient figure referred to? Aristotle was a man who attempted to understand rationally life, the universe, and everything, to pull it all together into uh, a, a greater package of, of knowledge and understanding. Now, this quest for reasoning and discovery through, through, through rational thought and debate, there's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but we need to understand that it comes from below. It's what we can attain through our considerable human powers of observation and reasoning and experimentation that we do together. But we need to understand as well that it is constantly locked below. How do we escape the limits of our knowing? How do we escape the biases of our subjectivity? That is very troubling. And as we look at this, you know, this quest for what is the good life in the ancient world, one of the reasons that it, it, it just ends in a kind of an uncertain chaos is there's no place to stand. There's no certain point at which we can say, this is the beginning point when we're, when we're coming in from below. There's, there's, there's no firm ground on which to begin and say, well, this is the criterion on which we can, we can judge this. We need something, someone outside ourselves if we're, if we're going to accomplish that. Otherwise, we're stuck. And for the world, a good life is self-sufficient. You know, at the end of the day, your tribal connections may fail. The spiritual powers may abandon you. Your knowledge may prove to be insufficient. We need them, but we can't rely on them. In the end, we have to be enough if we're coming from this perspective. We have to be enough, strong enough, smart enough, clever enough, energetic enough, wise enough, Many of the great stories of, of the ancient heroes were stories of just this kind of person. You read Homer's Odyssey, and it's just fascinating how that guy has a solution to every problem. You know, he comes up with all of, all of this great stuff on the fly. Uh, you know, we're like that as well. Americans are the original rugged individualists. The great heroes of modernity are the same kind of people, people that we celebrate for overcoming obstacles, for pioneering, for leading by their own wits. I think this is true of the heroes of popular entertainment. Um, I love Shawshank Redemption. I like any movie that's got redemption in the title, okay? But how is Andy Dufresne re redeemed, spoiler alert? by his own wits. Okay, I didn't give much away if you haven't seen that current movie. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not quite as old as the Brothers Karamazov, so I, I feel like we need to cut people some slack <laughs> on that, okay? You know, um, how, about, how about Phil Connors in Groundhog Day, another recent release? <laughs> you know, he's stuck in time, and he only gets out when he kind of masters time, and very important to Hollywood, masters romance because there's no redemption without romance in, in Hollywood, okay? Or, to go in a different direction, MacGyver, okay? Or honestly, my favorite, Pinocchio. Yeah, I know, <laughs> Pinocchio, but you've been loyal, brave, and true. Now you're a real boy. That's, that's doing it from below. That's, that's relying on yourself. This is what Paul means in other passages when he talks about living in the flesh. It's a life of self-reliance, and it's going to fail. 
It's going to fail. In sum, the world's got lo good life is about having status, being the most, finding glory and strength, being enough, and it fails, okay? If we're experiencing imposter syndrome, it's because we intuitively recognize this. It's because we have tried, and it's not working, and we are struggling to admit it. That would, as, 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 as we all do. Well, let's then understand how we evaluate a life from the perspective of that which is united with Christ. And what adjectives can we use here? There are a lot of them. Or at least there are more good words than there are bad words. Based, gas, slaps, Gucci, fire, sick, dripping, snatched, dope, eats, slays, vibing, has riz, give it grad, the Fortnite battle pass, clean, cl clean and busted. Okay. I just want you to know I feel so good right now. I thought this is going to just bomb. And it, thanks for working with me, okay? All right, uh, evaluating a life united with Christ. For the world, a good life is tribal. In Christ, a good life is global, okay? We belong to one another globally. When Paul talks about serving Gentiles, as he does in verse 1, he is coloring outside the lines of tribalism. He is breaking the mold of tribalism. He's a Jew. Gentile or nations is a word that Jewish people use for everybody else. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who divide everything into two categories and those who don't. And that's a little subtle. And, and the Jewish people divided the world into two categories, us and them, um, Israel and the nations. Paul now says, I'm living for them. I am breaking outside the bounds of tribalism. He's saying the same thing when he speaks of the stewardship of God's grace. This is no longer about attaining Jewish identity as we keep the law. This is through God's grace for everyone, irrespective of tribal boundaries like circumcision and clean and unclean. Why is this the case? Because the true God is not just the God of Israel. He is the God who has made all all peoples, and in Christ he becomes incarnate as a man of one people living among that people, but to fulfill God's promise to that people that God would bless all peoples through that one people. This is the great saga of the Bible. This is why as soon as we see the nations raging against each other at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, God comes in in chapter 12 with Abraham and says, by you I will bless all the families of the earth. And this is why Christians call each other Things like brother and sister. It defines the good life. It's about an ever-widening and deepening circle of identity and uh, love and concern and service. We become family with people very unlike ourselves, and we find joy and purpose in that. Now, I want to admit something. One of the reasons I didn't go to prom, uh, Brian brought this out in worship. I can't dance. Okay. And I sense I am not alone in that in this room. Okay. But I know globally Christians dance. Okay, because we're, you know, we're enfleshed people and we worship with our bodies. And I understand that. And I, this is why I am grateful for eternity in the global community of God's people, because I'm confident that I'm going to spend a lot of time in dance lessons with some very skilled sisters and brothers who are going to help me out. Okay, so I will get there. Okay, I will get to at least where it's, it's not cringe. Okay. And, and that's just one of the many ways that this global identity is expressed. Now, understanding when we say global, we're not talking about trade policy or diplomacy. Those are separate issues, very interesting, but we're not here to talk about them. We all have opinions on those things, and we're all mostly wrong. We are talking about, we're not talking about being extroverted or introverted. We're talking about a reorientation for those, um, fr from those who are like us to all people to recognizing those barriers have been dropped in Christ, and now we live in a different kind of community. We belong to each other. We love each other. We serve each other. For the world, the good life is powerful. In Christ, this one's hard. The good life is weak. You know, it's hard to be powerful for very long. Who's the most powerful person in the world? President of the United States. How long does that last? Some of us are thinking, in almost every case, a little too long, right? But not for long, not for long. You spend your whole life getting that thing, and it's gone. 
in a term or two. Um, you want to get a good discussion going with people. Who is the GOAT? Who is the greatest of all time? As soon as you, I know another one. I, I'm, I, I'm throwing them all around here. <laughs> okay. Who is the greatest of all time? Why is that debated? Because no matter how, where you are on the throne, you're going to be dethroned. You know, sorry, Babe Ruth, meet Shohei Otani, right? Okay, it's all happening uh, in, in that way. It is hard to be powerful, and Christ shows us we don't have to. Christ shows us we don't have to because he is the most powerful. He is the greatest of all time. But he became weak for our sakes. And so our lives are shaped by his life. He takes on our weakness, showing us that in weakness, his strength becomes everything. So if you're feeling weak, you're right where you belong. And that means that Christ is able to fill you with his strength. This is why Paul says unashamedly, I'm a prisoner. I'm a prisoner. I'm in a lowly position. And, and he breaks off that sentence. This is very interesting. Uh, Paul, at this point in the text, reminds me of a friend of mine from college who says, on the highway of my mind, there are many exit ramps, you know, kind of distracted by everything. Paul breaks off a sentence in verse 1 that he doesn't pick up again until verse 13. And in that, he's saying, I'm a prisoner, but don't be worried because this is for you. This is the, the in, in my weakness, you are being served through the power of Christ. This is why Christians use words like servant and even slave in ways that are not disparaging. But they adopt them willingly because they understand in lowliness, in weakness, in service, we truly reflect who Christ is. We truly live as God created us to be. We reflect the true God in the world. For the world, a good life seeks to gain knowledge. In Christ, a good life has knowledge revealed by God. I'm, I've, I've riffed too much. I'm running out of time. I need to just say something briefly about this. We humans do have an enormous God-given capacity for knowledge in the main. But this doesn't define our humanity. We're just as human if we, if we struggle with that. And we all recognize that our knowledge ultimately is contingent, is uncertain. What Paul talks about in this passage is that what we have in the gospel is what God has revealed. In Christ, God has broken through our limits, our subjectivity. He has shown us where that firm place is where we can stand to understand the good life. And so it's admitting that we can't figure it out and understanding by God's grace that what he has revealed is the foundation on which we stand. This is the nature of the life that is united with Christ. For the world, a good life is self-sufficient. In Christ, a good life is sufficient in Christ. I've always been an, uh, a sucker for that, for that narrative of self-sufficiency. You know, I've, I've been raised in the Christian faith, but I always thought if you're slick, you can kind of do it on your own too. You know what I mean? Just be smart, be clever, you know, make good choices. It'll all be smooth. <laughs> smooth. Yeah, it hasn't exactly worked out that way in my experience, all of which is a reminder that I'm really not slick. But Christ is more than sufficient. What seemed like Paul's failure was one of the most profound expressions of the sufficiency of Christ being in prison. Not in the flesh, but in the spirit we live. Not on my own, but with others in verse 6. You know, Paul describes this grace of God as, as he uses a word that says it's, it's like it doesn't have a bottom. You can't get to the bottom of it. I've been trying to touch bottom all my life so I could push up. There is no bottom. And that's a good thing. It's, it's, it's beyond even the grace of God, beyond even our ability to fully fathom it. And it's not access earned, but access received as a gift. And so we're not confident in ourselves, but we're confident through faith in Christ. So in sum, Christ's good life is not about status, but calling. It's not about being the most. It's about being what Paul says in verse 8, the least. It's not finding glory in strength, but finding glory in suffering. Life in Christ 
is very much like the life of Christ, the Christ who gave himself for us, focused on a cross, victorious in and despite what seems like defeat. Okay, let's catch a breath and consider. Life in Christ addresses our deepest needs and moves us towards our highest aspirations. It promises hardship, disappointment, suffering, rejection, sacrifice. And those two truths coexist. This is the greatest thing that we can aspire to, and it can be hard. How do we pursue this good life? Not as a guarantee of happiness all the time, even of mental health. Certainly not of perfect adjustment to every situation. Definitely not every day lived as if it is a mattress commercial in the middle of May. No, it's quite different because in Jesus, we see the full realization of a human person, fully in pursuit of the highest ideals of our existence, fully in fellowship with God the Father, fully engaged with those around him for their good, fully giving himself in submission to God for the sake of others, for us, even undeserving us. So we stand by that grace and we pursue the life that he has defined in the way that he has saved us. And that's why Paul says, don't lose heart. Years ago, I, I read the uh, book by J.I. Packer, Knowing God. And in that, he relates a story about a man who had suffered a, a great disappointment and then said, but it doesn't matter, for I've known God. And this is how we know God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have given us that which we cannot fathom, greater than we can imagine, and certainly more than we deserve in every way. In that realization experience of grace brought to us in the life and death and resurrection of your son, may we learn to be your people truly, to reflect truly what we have, have received, and in that to, to realize our greatest purpose in the name of Jesus.